understand how that schematic works. Now I'm going to tell you there's a lot more to an automatic transmission than there's a manual transmission. And that's one of the reasons I'm taking the time to show you these four slides. There's just four slides in here. Uh, does everybody recognize what this, how to interpret this? Anybody lost? Everybody lost. What do you see here? There's a torque converter. That's not too hard. Now look up here. See that? Converter and lube. That's basically the pressure you got. Main line pressure, uh, intake and decrease, modulator, accumulator. In other words, intake and de decrease is going to be where it pulls it out of the sump. See that? See the stripes? So you got suction pressure here, pulling this. The oil pump is a vein pump. I was talking to uh, Zane this morning about the different kind of transmission pumps. That's a vein pump right there. And you notice it's got a spring there so that it can basically change the capacity of the pump on the fly based on demand. Okay, and see all of this right here. Now, if you look at this, this is overdrive gear range first gear. Right now, what is this valve right here? Anybody know? This is a 4T60E trans transaxle, by the way, like you, like our old mobiles got it out here. What do you have there? That's the manual valve. Probably can't read the words from there. That's the valve that moves when you put your gear selector in gear. And that spool valve moves over and it's basically channeling the fluid. See where it's channeling the fluid to? Everywhere you see main line pressure is going to have pressure when that thing is in overdrive range first gear. And this is where it all goes. You see? Now, if you've got this laying in front of you on the table, you'll be able to read these words a lot better. But you notice it's going to the 3 4 shifts valve, the 2 3 shift valve, and so on and so forth. These are the little valve body. These are the valves in the valve body. And this is how all that stuff is piped. Now, I can spend a lot of time on this, but this modulator valve, who remembers from the last session we did what the modulator valve does? You remember? What does the modulator valve do? Modulates. It's got vacuum line going to it. Why does the transmission need a vacuum line going to this thing right here? Uh, so it can channel when the gears on. Exactly. So it, when you're into it heavier, your vacuum's lower. If you leave that line disconnected, or if it comes disconnected, it's going to hold the gear as long as shift hard. Now, most of them don't have that anymore. That Oldsmobile does. You can see it if you look down there. It's a diaphragm that looks just like that. It's basically what's going to give it the, this is going to override, you know, you got your governor pressure that's coming in there. As the, as the vehicle picks up speed, the pressure control solenoid, and I believe that's the way this was set up, but that's a dig. Well, look here, it is. See that solenoid right there? Pulse width modulator solenoid? This basically responds to the engine controller, and the engine controller watching vehicle speed is going to use that pulse width modulated solenoid to drive the pressure up and push these valves over and make it shift into the next gear. That's basically what you're looking at right here. Um, all right. So this accumulator, what are these accumulators for? Tell me what the accumulators are for, somebody. You asked me about one yesterday, didn't you? You asked me about, what'd you say? Your, your F-150 does what? Oh, uh, it shifts hard out of first. It shifts hard out of first, but all the rest of the gears are normal. Okay. One of the possibilities that will cause that is if he's got a one-two accumulator with a broken spring. Or the or the pit or it's stuck. You got me? The accumulator is about is like a cushion. When the fluid goes screaming up through there, it squeezes that spring and it causes it to shift a little gentler. Okay, so those are important too. Now these servos are the ones that operate the bands. See this band right here, that servo is actually going to drive that. But you notice this one right here, the forward servo has got fluid pressure pushing it in. It's applying that band. There's no pressure here. That was not applied. That was not applied. There's no fluid going to it. And there's a 3-4 accumulator, 1-2 accumulator, 2-3 accumulator. So you got all the accumulators to soften the shift. Now this is a torque converter clutch solenoid. Who can tell me what that one does? And it's not doing anything right now. Matter of fact, it's off. Whatever. What happens when the torque converter clutch solenoid energizes? Puts it in lockup. Puts it in its lockup. Now lockup means the engine is turning. The engine and the transmission output are locked together on that particular one. That's not the way this is right now. You got your overdrive gear range though. And you can look at this. Now what's what happens when I change to the next gear? That's the parts people. 
Hello, parts people. Yeah. 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 No. I'll do that. Come on, give them to me. Send them right now. Yeah. Do it. All right. All right. See right here. This is overdrive gear range second gear. In other words, it has shifted into second gear at this point, right? Now let's let's look at the difference between the previous slide and this one. See? See what you've done? What have you done? Somebody tell me. The one two accumulator has caught that pressure. See how it's it just goes. It's got that fluid going there now. There's a little check ball. And it's got that fluid. A couple of orifices right there. It goes through here. It squeezes that spring. It applies this clutch now. So your second clutch housing is now squeezing those clutches and that part of that. And that's what that's putting you. Know, and the planetary gear sets at the heart of all this, by the way. Okay. So let's back up. Let's back up. That's first gear, second gear, third gear. See what else happens? See, if you notice that this one is applied in both of those, but now your 2-3 accumulator, it's got pressure, and it has squeezed that spring, and basically, look where you're going up here. All right, let's back up. See that? See where the pressure happens? See how it changes down in this area right here? Now, my buddy, uh, see, I, I deliberately did that so we could basically tell. That's third gear with a converter clutch applied. Look at this. With a converter clutch applied, that's where you're in a lockup. All right, your torque converter clutch solenoid is now on. See where it's got that red on up there? And that's actually causing that converter to lock up. You can see this, the fluid, though. This fluid right here is basically staying. But the fluid's either being released or it's being, you know, it's got low pressure there. You're going to have... This, this strapity lines right there, and you see your converter and lube. Some of the pressure that's pumped around here is basically just going there to lubricate things. Some of it's under pressure. And so you guys were driving this thing the other day with the pressure gauge on it, so you could watch all of this stuff, watch the pressure. You weren't able to see what was going on, but you knew what gear you were in, what it was supposed to be doing. Everybody understand that? You're going to see these if you get a good comprehensive. Have you seen this in the book you're working with on that? transmission you're building over there. If you flip, you'll find one of these in there. If you can put your eyeballs on one of these and you can trace that, you can find out. If you say, okay, when I'm in third gear, uh, you know, for, to begin with, when I go into third gear, I'm neutralized. Uh, you know, and basically I'm saying, well, second gear works just fine, but I'm having an issue here, right? And so what I know now, because let's say if my third gear uh, it shifts first, second, and then it hits neutral, uh, and I'm sitting here saying, well, uh, I've got this that I'm going to be looking at right here. And I'm also looking at the pressure on the gauge when I'm driving it. If I see the pressure fall, I know that something's cracked up in here or I've got blown seals or something. Something's wrong. And it's keeping this from applying. So when I tear the transmission apart, when I come to this particular part here, I'm going to pay strong attention to that part because this is where my problem was. If you just stretch all the... You know, y'all got all that stuff out on the bench over there right now that you're getting ready to stack back together. Basically, you're just doing a disassembly and a reassembly. So you'll, and everybody in here is supposed to be doing one of those. Now, he's doing it on that one. Y'all are doing it on that one. Don't try to dodge that. If you want to get ready to tear a transmission apart, we'll set you up a bench and I got a transmission I'll put on there you can tear apart. Because everybody needs to do that this time at the very least. So you can get a feel for what it's like inside there. Uh, now then, we'll go to another place. There was only four slides on that, but I prepared those very carefully on that. All right, let me go back to my fall 2015 folder, and I'm going to go to manual trans, and we got about 10 or 12 minutes. I had a question from one of the quizzes on that. Yeah. It said cars with higher power, more fire, less gears. Why do the uh, track race cars have six feet? Well, you're basically wanting to keep the you're wanting to keep the engine in its power curve, and uh, if you're looking at a uh, if you got a situation there, let me point this over here if I can, huh? Well, it depends. I mean, I will tell you this: a lot of the people that like to drag race will have like a, a two-speed automatic transmission in there. 
but you guys, you guys seen a power curve from a dyno? Uh, if you basically, what you're going to have right here is you're going to have RPM and horsepower, and uh, basically, at about 3,600 RPM, an engine that's made for road use or whatever is going to begin to fall off. Now, on your uh, your stall speed converter, y'all fool with that? You know, you got a stall speed converter that's really high. Like, if, for instance, you're going to have a, a you know 3,200 or 3,600 or whatever stall speed converter. So you're locking your brakes down. You got your pedal on the floor. It's stalling right at the top of the power curve. So you've already got it pedal to the metal, and the torque converter's got you up at that in that power curve. And then when you dump the clutch, you're shooting off the line with your power curve already peaked. See what I mean? Instead of having to start off slow and go up, all the the the, the more that these the newer these vehicles get, the more gears they get. You know what I mean? So basically, the whole time you're driving that car, they want it to stay in the place where it's the most efficient. It's got the most power. Okay. Now you know what happens if you put it in a gear that's too high of a gear at too low of a speed, right? I mean, it sort of labors, and it's it's really not good for it and all that sort of thing. But uh, you're wanting to stay in that range all the way through your gears. You start off in first, you shift to second, you shift to third. Now in the old days they had old column shift, you know, first, second, third, or it was on the floor sometimes and all that. I was one time driving a uh, Plymouth Valari to Jacksonville when I had to go down there to a school when I was working at a Volkswagen place. And I don't know how I got stuck with a Plymouth Valari that had a stick in the floor. I mean it was became like that. You know, you imagine that. And I was and it was, the thing was wore out and it was hard to find the gears, you know. So I pulled up behind a dump truck and a light down there. And I, you know, I'm sitting here kind of waiting for everything to get through. And the dump truck starts backing up. And I'm close enough to him sitting there behind that light where he keeps seeing him. I'm like, oh no! I'm <laughs> I had a terrible time trying in reverse to get out from under the back of his truck. He almost backed all over me. I don't know how far he was going to keep backing, but he just run right over my car. But anyway, uh, that particular one just had a three-speed, but you know it was an underpowered engine. So the long and the short of it is, you're wanting to stay in your power curve. Just, that answered your question with a lot of uh, uh, long-time expensive stuff here. All right, now then, I'm gonna go up, up here to manual trans. I can get in there, and right here I'm gonna show you this right quick because this is a cool little thing. I've got a worksheet out there that you guys have got on doing this uh, manual transmission on this one here. All right, we're going to look at this. And everybody burn this in because this is really important. Now, what I want to do, hold on. All right, we got one of these over here. Now, it's been taken apart and put back together a few times. But when everybody does it, I want you to take it seriously. The bad part about having one that's been taken apart and put back together a few times is if, it, if it's not just like brand new and pristine, then we're going to wind up, you know, people say, well, you know, it's already messed up, so I'm just going to throw the parts all back in there. Uh, but you're going to have that when you're going to take it apart and put it back together. Pay attention to this because this is important to understand. The input gear drives the counter shaft. What's the counter shaft? Somebody tell me the counter shaft. Where's the counter shaft on this thing? The bottom one. That's the one right here. Anytime that engine is running and the clutch is engaged, this is going to be turning and that's going to be turning. I don't care what gear you're in. This and this are going to be driven together, period. Now right? you might notice as you go down here, this right here starts off with a really big gear and then a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller. And then on the back side back there, you got your fifth gear. And, you know, reverse is actually a, a gear in here that's not hard for them to illustrate. But your power flow in neutral goes nowhere. Nothing's going out there. It's just going right in here. All right. Everybody see that, right? This is power flow in first gear. Get this burned in. It goes in here, it goes down here, it goes all the way back there, which is your divider plate where the bearings are. You know, it's, it's like that transmission over there. It's going to come up. So how is this giving us first gear? It's going down to the bottom. We've got it. Well, yeah, they're always going to do that except in fourth. But right here we're going... This gear is a smaller gear is turning this big gear. And this gear right here is a small gear turning a big gear. So basically, 
all you've got is just like this gear is turning that gear, but because you've added the third gear, this is turning the same direction as that. When you add a third gear, it's going to be turning the same direction. And so that goes out the back. So the way that happened is this slides back. Click. You got it? And that makes this gear now, because it's locked to this and that's locked together, that makes this gear a part of that output shaft. And so because that gear is now part of the output shaft, this counter shaft is driving that gear, and that's where your gearing is coming from. Now that you understand that, we can go faster through the rest of them. All right. This is power flow in second gear. See how that happens? All right. This is going in the same way. That's still turning. It's going through this gear here. Why? Because you shifted from first to second. Click. See how that came forward? And it made this gear a part of this shaft now. That one is freewheeling on that shaft, as is this other one up here in the front of it. So your power flow is going through here to that, and you notice that gear is a little bigger than this one was, and that one there is a little smaller. It's like your 10-speed bicycle going out the back. All right, power flow in third gear is right here. It's going here. You've gone up another step. See that? This is not hard to understand when you get your head wrapped around it. Part of your final exam for manual transmission is going to be to take a manual, take a transmission. I'm going to sit out here and show me the power flow. You got to be able to show me the power flow, and I can go through this until I'm blue in the face, and I can set the thing up on the bench. We can talk about it. I can show you. We can go over it, and people sit here and they sweat bullets and they cry and all other kind of stuff because they can't remember the dead power flow. Burn this in, okay? Don't forget it. This goes in, goes down, goes up, and goes back. I will tell you though that I rebuilt manual transmissions for six years and didn't know how they worked. Nobody, I, wouldn't, I didn't go to school, I just learned how to rebuild the transmission and I could put all those gears back together you know, so they'd work. The input gear drives a counter shaft, your three four synchronizer, which is this part here that your shift fork is on, clicks that back to this gear, that one's back in neutral, these are freewheeling, that one is now a part of that shaft and it's carrying the power through that counter gear on the way out. Cluster gear, counter gear, whatever you call it. All right, we're almost through here. The input shaft in fourth gear is driven all the way through. That's a straight lockup right there. Got it? This is whirling, but every gear on that shaft is freewheeling, including that one, that one, that one, that one. This one here is doing nothing except driving that, and that power is going nowhere, but it's locked together like it's all one shaft. You got that? Locked together like it's all one shaft. All right, now look at fifth gear. This is a tricky one. This is that plate on the back side of the transmission where those bearings are. The power, I mean, the power is driven in here, goes all the way back through that plate. There's a little gear driving a big gear. There's a great big gear back here and a little gear here. What that means is this is turning faster than this in fifth gear, right? And, and there's reverse. See reverse on that one? How does that work? Anybody tell me? Notice how it moves that gear? That gear right there? All right, you got to go through here. Wait a minute. Let me get up so you can see the rest of the words. The fifth reverse synchronizer sleeve moves rear and locks the reverse gear in the counter shaft. And the reverse gear synchronizer sleeve on the input shaft slides back. Locks the reverse speed gear to the output shaft. You only got two gears there, technically, and so this one's going to turn in the opposite direction from that one. See the arrows? That's how that works. Now, the other transaxle I'm going to show you over there, the reverse is actually in here. And this first gear has actually got teeth on the outside of it. Well, I'm sorry, this first gear synchronizer, and it actually does it a different way than that M50D over there. Uh, and you got 3.9, 71 to 1 is your ratio on that. That's hard to illustrate on this uh, cartoon, is what it basically amounts to. Okay, so uh, if I have you guys come up here and draw this on the board, are you going to be able to make it happen for me? Walk everybody through it so everybody understands it. Here's what you want to do, and I'm going to tell you this like I tell everybody else. Whenever you uh, get to where you're trying to soak any of this up, you've been, if anybody has been in here very long, hear me say that. 
find somebody that will listen to you, that thinks enough of you to listen to what you're saying, and explain this to them, and every time you explain it, you'll get a little smarter than you were before. Every now and then when some of you guys have mastered something, a particular task, I may say, show him how to do that. You know, that's not me ducking out on the job. That's me getting you an opportunity to know it better by teaching somebody else. When you teach somebody else, you're going to know it better than you will if somebody else. You see what I'm saying? If somebody, if you're just learning, everything that I've said in here today, you've retained 12% of it. Right? But if you teach somebody else, you'll return 88%. Because you have to put it in your mind and bring it out your mouth where they understand it. Got that? So everybody's going to tell somebody how transmission works, right? When you leave here today. Tell somebody how it works. Tell them how to draw pictures. You know what I mean? I got a counter shaft. I got a cluster here. May have you do it next time we meet. Get up here and get, get, get up here and draw it for me. Pick somebody at random. Feel like I can do it. And, uh, so.